Great, so uh, I'll just start by quickly introducing myself. So um, I'm Dr. Katrina Silvey. Um, I have been a researcher in various different linguistics and psychology departments um, in the UK and the US. Um, I have a lot of experience running studies both in the lab and online, and now I work at Gorilla. Um, and with me here on the webinar today is my colleague, Dr. Ashley Johnston, um, who uh, yeah, also works at Gorilla, obviously, and she'll be in the chat um, posting helpful links that kind of relate to what I'm talking about as we go through, so do keep an eye out for those. Um, but yeah, I thought I'd start by telling you a little bit about Gorilla, about um, what it is we do and um, how we got started. Um, so Gorilla was launched in um, October 2016, um, by Cauldron Science. And these are our founders, uh, Joe Evershed, who has a background in business and psychology, and Nick Hodges, uh, who has a background in game development. So Joe is our CEO and Nick is our CTO. Um, and our mission really at Gorilla is to liberate behavioral scientists from having to program up their own experiments from scratch um, with the broader goal of freeing them up to focus on the science so they can go ahead and do world-changing research. Um, so since Gorilla was founded, it's gone from strength to strength, it's expanded, um, and you can find out more information about the current team on our About page. Um, and most of our staff have some kind of background in behavioural research. Um, so um, as I mentioned, I'm among them and so is Ashley. Um, and on a personal level, I'm happy that even though I'm not directly involved in research myself anymore, um, I get to contribute to making it easier for scientists to take their research online. So the next question is really, why take your research online? What are some of the benefits? So we generally argue that there are three main benefits to taking your research online. And the first is speed. Um, if you've ever run a study in the lab, you'll know that it's extremely time consuming. Um, you're usually very limited in terms of the number of participants you can run simultaneously. You're competing for space um, with other researchers. You usually have to, to book specific labs. Um, there's a lot of admin involved in actually recruiting people and getting them to um, physically come to the space where you are. Um, so by taking your research online, you can avoid a lot of these hurdles. Um, you're basically unlimited in terms of how many participants you can run simultaneously. Um, and the result is that you can buy back your time for the stuff that's really important. Um, so you can spend more time actually conceiving and designing your study, um, making sure that your experiment design is well tailored to your research question. Um, you can spend more time uh, learning about the best possible ways to analyze your data. Or you can have a weekend. Um, uh, we all know that work-life balance can be a challenge in academia, and um, one way to sort of reclaim a bit of your work-life balance can be to um, run your studies online by back a bit of your time. Uh, the second main benefit is scale. Um, so uh, you can um, get much larger samples using an online participant pool than if you are limited to the population of people who can um, physically come to your lab. Um, we're all aware of the ongoing replication crisis in psychology and in the behavioral sciences more broadly. Um, and one aspect of addressing that, by no means the only aspect, but one possible thing that we can do is to run larger studies with larger samples um, as a way of ensuring that our findings are more robust in the future. Um, and running your studies online makes that easy. Um, and finally, uh, another major benefit is reach. So you can access populations um, who might find it hard or impossible to actually come to your lab. So um, for example, you can access low SES populations, um, people who are working. Um, you can access more vulnerable populations. Um, and you can also uh, get populations that are more representative. So um, another aspect of uh, the replication crisis is that in the past, we have tended to run our studies on very homogeneous populations um, of undergraduate psychology students who are weird. So uh, from Western educated, industrialized, rich democratic societies. Um, and if you run your stud studies online, you can reach um, populations that you cannot reach from uh, from your physical lab. 
So for all of these reasons, um, online research is a great solution to both maximizing your research time um, and also producing high quality, robust findings at the same time. Um, but there are a number of questions that tend to come up when people are considering whether or not they can take their research online. Um, and you might have some of these questions yourself. So firstly, um, you might be skeptical that your specific study is actually going to work online. Um, maybe you think it's just too complicated to be able to trust remote participants to behave appropriately to understand the instructions. Um, or maybe you use a method that has traditionally been bound to the lab. Um, secondly, you might worry about whether you have the technical skills that you're going to need um, to get an online study up and running. Um, do you need to be able to code? Um, what about setting up a server to store the data? These can seem um, overwhelming when you first start thinking about online research. And finally, you might just not quite trust the idea of data from online studies, um, especially if you're used to running studies in the lab. Um, and this one breaks down into a number of specific objections, um, which I will talk about a bit later on. But to address the first question, oops, sorry, skipped a slide. Uh, the first question, um, can my study be done online? Um, and the first argument that it can is that people are doing all kinds of studies online. Um, across a huge range of different fields. Um, so we track publications that cite Gorilla. So um, this is specifically talking about the subset of online studies that happen to use um, our software. Um, so there's obviously way more than these. Um, but so far, um, we've got a collection of 72 published papers from 2021 alone. Um, and I pulled out some of the keywords uh, that classify these publications, and you can see that these studies are from a huge range of fields of methods. Um, and what makes this possible is the flexibility of um, the task builder that we um, offer as part of our tools and our library of zones, which is what's showing in this GIF over here. Um, and zones are the building blocks of a task. You can think of them as kind of being like Lego bricks. Um, you combine them together to make the protocol that you've got in your head come to life on the screen. Um, and the way that we have this set up, you can display a huge range of stimuli and you can collect an even wider range of responses from participants. Um, so you're really not as constrained as you might think uh, in the kinds of research you can do online. Um, so as it's going to show you in a second, with our advanced zones, you can even do things like eye tracking, audio recording, uh, mouse tracking, all online. Um, but now to get a little bit more specific, I'm going to share a couple of case studies with you of researchers who have successfully moved traditionally lab-based research online. So this first study is by uh, Bryony Payne and colleagues. Um, and uh, this study was published this year in the British Journal of Psychology. And the researchers were interested in um, an effect known as self-prioritization, um, which is a phenomenon where you tend to react more quickly and accurately to stimuli that you associate with yourself versus stimuli associated with others. And the researchers were interested in whether this effect would um, extend to the case of externally generated voices. So basically, if you ask someone to listen to your recording of someone else's voice, and you tell the, you tell the person, this is now your voice, this, this voice belongs to you, um, do people then respond more quickly to that externally generated voice that they've been told to identify with themselves than they do to another novel voice that is associated with a friend or with a stranger? Um, and the researchers found that they do. Basically, there is a robust effect of self-prioritization, even in the case of um, this kind of novel stimulus that's just recently been associated with the self. And um, they found this by a reaction time of a keyboard press when participants were judging whether um, a stimulus was a match with their self voice or a mismatch. Um, and this has really interesting implications, this research, for um, specifically for users of synthesized voices. So um, for people who, for whatever reason, um, are not able to use their own uh, self-generated voice and instead have to rely on a synthesizer, this suggests that those people can still strongly identify those um, synthesized voices as themselves. 
Um, and this actually resonates with real life examples. Um, so you might be aware that uh, Stephen Hawking was at one point offered um, a more advanced upgrade of uh, his synthesized voice, but he actually refused the upgrade because he felt at that point that uh, the current voice that he had, um, while maybe technologically that less sophisticated, he really felt that it was his in a meaningful sense. Um, so in terms of the methods of this study, um, oh yeah, uh, Ashley's just dropped a link in the chat. Uh, we have a interview with Bryony where she talks um, about this study. I really recommend checking that out if you're interested. Um, and she also talks about some of the challenges that came with implementing it online. So the study involved um, presentation of audio and complex randomization. So this is a screenshot from uh, the actual experiment tree in Gorilla. So you can see that participants are being randomized to a number of different conditions. Um, and the researchers also wanted to make sure that their participants were attending uh, closely to the audio. Um, and so they decided to do that by making sure their participants were using headphones rather than speakers. Um, and so they used um, a headphone check that we actually have available in our samples library that we have in Gorilla. So they were able to just kind of copy that and um, incorporate it into their experiment. Um, and it's a kind of um, clever trick where it plays some tones in a way that you can only discriminate the tones if you're listening on headphones, not if you're listening on speakers. Um, so that enabled them to kind of uh, control that aspect of their participants equipment. Um, the task and the experiment and everything are all available on our Google Open Materials. Again, that's linked from uh, the interview. Um, uh, so you can take a look at it yourself. And because it's on Open Materials, you can actually also copy it yourself and um, either run it on your own participants or adapt it um, if you have a similar research question um, and if these materials would be helpful to you. <clears throat> um, okay, so you might be thinking, fine, but um, audio-based research, language research, um, that's not that difficult to translate online. What about something that has really traditionally been bound to the lab? What about something like eye tracking? Um, so this is a study by Alex Neil Richardson and colleagues. Um, there's a preprint on uh, bioarchive that you can take a look at. Um, <clears throat> and I find this study fascinating. I learned a lot reading this preprint. Um, it was motivated by an evolutionary puzzle, which is why do zebras have these very distinctive broad stripes on their rump? Um, and it turns out that this, this is a puzzle because while there's some evidence that um, narrow bands of stripes can work well to deter parasites, that doesn't seem to be the case for these broad stripes. So the researcher's hypothesis was um, that these broad stripes are particularly salient to the predators of the zebra when the zebra is in motion. So specifically when the zebra is running away, these rump stripes are, are particularly salient. Um, and they run simulations in their paper of uh, predator capture showing that if the predator is tracking the zebra's rear, then the predator is actually less likely to catch the zebra. So that's the kind of reason for the, the evolutionary hypothesis. And the way they tested this was they got some photographs of zebras and they simulated how they would look through the vision of the zebra's top predators and also how they would look in motion versus not in motion. And they got a computer model and human participants to take a look at these images and judge which parts of the zebra were most salient. And for the human participants, uh, so basically they found that both the humans in the model um, agreed that the, the rear stripes were particularly salient when the zebra was in motion. So that um, kind of backed up their hypothesis. Um, in terms of the methods, the way they did this for the human participants was they used mouse tracking. So mouse tracking is a kind of still developing quite cutting edge method that's being used in online research. Um, that tries to kind of translate eye tracking in a more reliable way to online experiments. So um, in Gorilla, we have a mouse tracking zone that you can use um, in your tasks directly. You don't have to do any coding. You can just incorporate it just like another Lego brick. Um, and another really uh, nifty feature that this task uses. So it was important for the researchers to know that their participants were all seeing the images um, at the same size, regardless of what equipment they might have in terms of monitors. Um, so to do this, they used the screen calibration zone, which is another um, ready-made zone that we have um, that enables you <clears throat> to ensure that your participants are viewing images at the same size, 
regardless of, of their equipment. So um, you basically get them to hold up a credit card on the screen and then adjust its size until um, the resolution means that they're all viewing images at the same size. Um, so that's um, another technical check that uh, we have available. Okay, so hopefully I've demonstrated that there is um, at least a range of research that you can um, feasibly do online, even if it doesn't seem initially like it would be possible. The second main question people tend to have is about technical skills. You might at this point be thinking, okay, but maybe these researchers are just super geniuses who um, have been able to build these tasks from scratch. And they are geniuses, their research is really cool, but um, you do not have to be um, a technical wizard to get a task of this complexity online using Gorilla. Um, and as some evidence for this, um, it's one of the most common things that our users say um, about our software is that it's very easy to use. So we have specific testimonials from these lovely individuals here. Um, we also run a survey every time we introduce um, new users to the platform and ease of use is the top thing that people mention as Gorilla's best feature, um, closely followed by its flexibility. Um, but you don't just have to take these people's word for it, um, because at the end of this presentation, I'm going to take you through the process of building a simple task in 15 minutes. Um, so you'll get to actually follow along and see how easy it is to use. Um, and if you do get stuck, then we have uh, comprehensive support resources available. So we have a full documentation system, um, which um, I think Ashley will be dropping links to parts of our documentation system later on when I start uh, building the task. Um, and we also have a friendly and responsive support team who um, will respond to any tickets that you might submit. Um, further piece of evidence that you don't need to have a lot of technical skills to get started. So UCL um, now has their first year psychology students start to use Gorilla to build their own experiments in the first four weeks of their first year. So these are brand new psychology students. Um, and the great thing about uh, it being so easy to get started with building experiments on Gorilla is, again, it gives them more time to actually focus on the science, to really get to grips with the experimental question and to um, make the, the best design that they can come up with without being limited by their technical ability. Um, and one of the posters from um, these research projects actually won the best research poster prize at a recent BPS conference. So this really enables the, these brand new undergraduate students to do proper science. They can do real research that can compete um, on a professional level. Okay, so now on to probably the biggest of the concerns slash questions that people usually have, which is if I take my research online, will I get good data? And as I said earlier, this is um, a multifaceted question that breaks out down into three main concerns. And those concerns are firstly control. So how do I make sure that my participants are gonna behave correctly or understand the instructions when I can't see them? You know, you're used to being in the lab, being able to physically see your participants. How do you deal with that when they're somewhere very far away and you have no access to what they're doing? Um, secondly, data quality. So you might be worried that data that you collect online will be noisier, perhaps there might be more variation to the point where it might be um, <clears throat> difficult uh, to impossible for you to recover the effect that you're interested in. And thirdly, timing accuracy. So in the lab, you can use um, very precisely calibrated equipment to uh, display stimuli and to measure reaction times. Um, online, you're reliant on whatever equipment the participant may happen to have at home, and there is obviously huge variation in the resources that your participants will have available. So this is another um, very valid concern that people have um, about online research. So I'm going to start by talking about control. Um, and the first thing I would suggest when you're thinking about uh, the lack of control that you have over your participants online is to think about how much control you actually had in the lab. Um, and we have a blog post on this, which I've linked here, um, about uh, the illusion of control. So in the lab, yes, you can see your participant, and yes, you can control their environment, and probably most importantly, their equipment. But you can't force them to understand the instructions, um, and you can't force them to attend to the task. Um, and having been a participant in many lab studies myself, um, there are several I can think of where 
the instructions were actually not very clear. And I think sometimes when we um, run participants in the lab, we use the fact that we're present and can answer any questions as an excuse not to write the clearest instructions that we could. Um, so that's one thing is to think about, well, actually, both in the lab and online, we should be making it, um, we should be writing our instructions such that it's, um, you know, as easy as possible for participants to follow them. Um, secondly, some of the things that you can definitely unambiguously control in the lab, such as uh, equipment, uh, there are technical workarounds for checking these online. Um, so I've already mentioned this when I talked about the case studies um, earlier. So uh, if, for example, it's important for you that your participants are using headphones, um, we have uh, a check that's ready to go that you can insert into your experiments. Um, we also have, as well as the screen calibration zone for making sure that participants are all viewing images at the same size, we also have a very cool sample called the virtual chin rest, which can actually test how far your participants are sitting from the screen, which um, opens up the range of stimuli that you can use if you need to know, for example, um, degrees of visual angle. Um, so these are, these are problems, they're undeniably problems, but they are problems that real researchers have face and have developed workarounds for. And now those workarounds are available and are being shared so that you don't have to come up with one yourself, basically. Um, and thirdly, again, this is something that really should apply to lab studies as well as to studies um, that are being run online. Um, it makes sense to decide ahead of time uh, which data you're going to exclude. Um, so you need to set up objective measures of data quality. Um, and this can actually be tricky. So again, whether you're in the lab or online, um, it's often hard to tell the difference between a participant who is not paying attention and a participant who is genuinely finding the task really difficult. Um, and in general, um, we advise that you should pay participants regardless of the quality of their data. So that's um, an ethical point that it's a separate decision uh, whether to pay them, uh, from whether to include their data in your analysis. Um, and there's more about this uh, in a talk uh, by Jenny Rod, uh, which I will link to in the next slide. But the general message from, from this slide is that um, really a lot of these problems are things we should already be thinking about in the lab. And what online studies do and the vulnerabilities they expose, they kind of give us fewer excuses for um, suboptimal research practices. Um, and this leads us on to the general question of data quality. What about the data quality from online studies? How worried should we be about it? So this slide is more focused on practical tips um, for steps to take if you're concerned about the quality of data in online studies. Um, the first tip is to make your first step to replicate a study that you've done in the lab um, where you have a robust effect. And the way we talk about this is convince your internal reviewer to convince that voice that's saying this is never going to work. Um, if your online data look similar enough to your lab data, if you can still recover the effect you're interested in, um, then that's a good sign that the type of research you do um, is possible um, to take online. Um, second practical tip, if you're taking research online, keep your study as short as you can. Um, the key is to maintain participant engagement and attention, and that gets harder to do the further beyond around 15 minutes that you go. <clears throat> um, and thirdly, something that doesn't tend to occur to researchers, again, probably because we're working with an old model um, of uh, when you, know, you had to be physically in, in the lab with participants. And so again, they could ask you questions face to face if they didn't understand. Use video instructions. Don't make your participants read through paragraphs and paragraphs of text. Um, show them what they're supposed to do. And that's the best way of making sure that all of them are on the same page um, without having to rely on their ability to parse long, complicated chunks of text. Um, and as I said, there's more helpful tips in this talk, which I've linked on the slide. Um, this is a great talk by Jenny Rod. Um, which again, um, Ashley has just dropped the link in the chat. So that's um, if you want to take a look. Uh, and this is a talk from the Be Online conference, which is a conference that we sponsor um, that's all about online research methods. So on that website, there's way more talks on the topic if that's something you'd be interested in exploring. Um, and the final concern um, about online data that people have tends to be about timing accuracy. 
So this is a paper um, published in Behavioral Research Methods. Uh, the research is led by Alex Anwil Irvin. Um, and the researchers were kind of ingenious, I think. They actually um, tested uh, the visual display time of stimuli um, in studies that were being run online across a range of devices, operating systems, browsers, and platforms. And the way they did this was by using an actual photodiode sensor to really see exactly how long the stimuli were displayed for. And they did something similar for reaction time using a robot actuator. So as you can hopefully see here, it's basically a robot finger that presses the space bar. Um, and they measured the latency between the um, actual uh, pressing time, which they could obviously very precisely control, and when the keyboard press was recorded by each of the platform's um, browsers, operating systems combos. Um, there's a lot of information in this paper. I would recommend giving this a read if this is something that's relevant to your research. Um, the short version is that timing accuracy is pretty good across all of the platforms that were tested. So they didn't just test Gorilla, they also tested JS Psych, Lab.js and Psycho.js, which are other um, popular platforms for running research online. Um, there are slightly weird effects of particular combinations of all the things they tested. So um, as I said, check the paper for more and you can make an informed decision for yourself um, on how much this matters for your research. Um, but yeah, for most purposes, timing accuracy from these platforms um, is good enough. Um, if you're considering using another platform that's not on this list, you would have to uh, test it yourself. Okay, so now I'm going to pause and turn to a quick demonstration of building a task oops, uh, in Gorilla. I'm just going to have a little quick, quick sip of water first because I've been talking too much. Okay, <clears throat> so what I'm showing you now, this is a project page in Gorilla. So I set one up for today um, called Sage Webinar Demo. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a simple relational reasoning task. So the first step is to go to the Create button and we select Task Builder Task. And we're going to give it a name, we're going to call it RR for relational reasoning. So this is what a black task looks like in Gorilla. Um, and the first thing we need to do is fill out the structure of the task. So if you think about the structure of a typical psychological task on an abstract level, um, it usually starts with some instructions. So that's what we're going to do. On this screen, we're creating displays that we're going to show to the participants. Um, and so the first thing we're going to do is create an instructions display. So we click the plus and let's call this instructions. Okay, um, then after the participants have seen the instructions, we usually want them to see the trials, so a number of task trials. So let's add a display called trial. And these are empty for now, we're going to fill them in with content in a second. And then finally, we usually want to um, show participants some sort of end screen or debrief. So let's add a final display called end. Okay, and each of these displays can contain one or more screens. And to show you what I mean by screens, I'm going to click the plus to add a screen and show you the templates we have. So you can see they look a little bit like PowerPoint slides. Um, they're just uh, basically templates for the information that you want to show to your participants at each stage of the task. Um, and also contain um, ways for participants to respond, such as uh, buttons. So for the instructions, we really want to just show them some text and give them a button to press next once they're ready to start. And that's what this template does. So this rich text template has a single block of markdown, which is how we format the text with a continue button to progress. So if we use that template and then we click it, you can see it pops up over here. And if we click this uh, rich text zone, you can see it has some placeholder text in it already. So we can replace that with and some text. And for now, we're just going to put, again, some placeholder text. Um, the general idea, how we advise using Gorilla, is that you fill in the broad structure of your task, and then you come back at the end and fill in the details. So we would come back and fill in proper instructions later on. But for now, we'll leave that as it is. Um, next, we can fill in uh, the end screen. So let's add a screen here. 
can see that here, instead of having a next button, we wanted to have some text again, but a text that just displayed for a certain amount of time and then moved the participant on. You can see that we don't have a template for that specifically. The closest thing is probably this template image with time limit. Um, and again, something that we advise if you're using Gorilla is find a template that is close enough to what you need to do and then tweak it. That's almost always going to be simpler than trying to build it up from scratch. So let's take this template again. If you click it, it shows up here. And what we want to do is change this image to some text. So we can do that by clicking Edit Layout. We click what's currently an image zone. We change it to rich text, click OK, and we're done. We've got um, a text zone here. Again, we have some placeholder text that's already here. Let's change this to a very minimal debrief message that, again, we would come back and fill in properly later on. Um, so that's our instructions in our end screen, and we're ready to build our trial. Um, as I said, each display can have um, more than one uh, screen in it. So if I click the plus, um, we are going to have a fixation cross. If you click it, you can see how that's set up here. So it's going to show the cross for 250 milliseconds. Um, and before and after, it will pause for 100 milliseconds. If you click these, you can change them um, to whatever it is that you uh, need. And then we're going to add the actual trial screen. So as I mentioned, we're building a relational reasoning task. So the format of these is typically the participants will see one large image, which is a grid um, of patterns of images, and there'll be one element missing. And we're going to ask participants to pick from four possible responses uh, which image belongs in the gap. And this template image with four image buttons is exactly what we need for this purpose. So if we select this, click it, it shows up. And the next step is to tell Gorilla which images to show um, in each of these image slots on each trial. So if we click the big image, one thing we could do is simply type in the file name of an image here. Um, that would work if we uploaded that image to our stimuli, but it would mean we would uh, be showing the same image on every single trial. And we don't usually want that. Usually in the, in the task, we want to have the trial structure stay the same, but the specific images change from trial to trial. And the way we do that in Gorilla is to use the spreadsheet. So here, instead of uh, typing a file name, we instead type the name of a column in the spreadsheet. And in that column, we're going to put the file names of all of the images that we want to show um, in this slot on each trial. So this is the large image. So you can think of it as um, being uh, the puzzle, the relational reasoning puzzle. So let's call the spreadsheet column puzzle. Click OK. And I'm going to do exactly the same for each of the response image options that are going to be given to the participant, because we're also going to fill those in from the spreadsheet, because they're going to change from trial to trial. And I'm actually going to make a deliberate mistake here just to show you something. And that is the color coding that we have in the task builder to help you out. So orange means static content. And that means that whatever you put in this box will be shown um, on every single trial for every single participant. Um, that makes sense for something like the instructions, which is only going to be shown once anyway. Um, but for things like stimuli on trials, you usually instead want those to be drawn from the spreadsheet. And that's what the green color coding means. So we can see that this, this is set wrong, this is set as static when it should be set to spreadsheet. So we fix that and we click OK. Um, and that's us done. We've filled in our task structure and we're now ready to move to the spreadsheet and start um, telling Gorilla what images we want to show. So um, this is the spreadsheet which controls the progression of the task in Gorilla. And you'll see that um, it's already filled in all of these columns. And that's based on what you've put into the task structure. Gorilla figures out what you're going to need to specify and puts those columns into the spreadsheet. So you can see it's put in columns for all of the um, images that we're going to need to insert. Um, you can actually fill in the spreadsheet online if you want. Um, it's relatively time consuming to do that, though. We would usually recommend that you download a spreadsheet, which will have all of these columns in it, and then upload one that you have uh, filled in in Excel. Um, which is what I'm doing right now. So just to walk you through what the spreadsheet is, it's easiest if we look at the display column. So rows in the spreadsheet step through time in your task. So the top of the spreadsheet is the beginning. 
So you can see that we start by showing participants the instructions display. And this refers to the displays that you've set up in the task structure. Then we show them seven task trials. And then finally, we show them the end screen. Uh, and you'll also notice that instructions in the end are highlighted in green. And that means that Gorilla recognizes um, these displays. Um, it can match them to something that you set up in the task structure. Um, but you'll notice that task is not highlighted in green. And this tells us that we have a problem. Gorilla can't match this to anything that's in the task structure. So to figure out what's going on, let's look at the task structure. This should be the correct display, but you can see it's called trial, not task. So we have a name mismatch. So we need to fix that, make this match the spreadsheet. And then we go back to the spreadsheet, you can see it's now highlighted in green, so that is now um, sorted. Um, these file names are uh, the image stimuli that we're going to use in the experiment. You can see that those are not highlighted in green. Um, that's not surprising because we haven't uploaded them yet. So we need to go to the next tab, the stimuli tab, and upload them. So you click add new stimuli. I'm just going to select all of the images in this folder and click upload. And the exact same principle applies if you're using um, audio files, video files, any kind of stimuli you want to present, you would upload them in the same way. <clears throat> okay, so that's done. You can preview uh, your images, make sure they're all showing up correctly. If we go back to the spreadsheet, you can see those are all now highlighted in green, which is great. And we're actually ready to preview our task. So if you click preview, we can see the instruction screen, click next. And this is what the trials look like. So we can, um, I'll just click randomly through these so you can see the overall structure of the task. Here's our debrief screen where we have the time limit. And then we progress. And because this is a preview, um, you can immediately download the data that was generated. And we would really recommend that you do this because it's the best possible way to figure out that all your data are recording as you want them to record uh, before you actually send your task out to participants. But for now, I'm going to go back to the spreadsheet and show you um, a couple of other things. So the first is the randomized trials column. So we usually don't want to show trials in the same order to every single participant. We usually want to shuffle them. And um, the way you do that is using randomized trials column. Um, and the way this works is for any row where this column is blank, those rows will be shown in the original order that they are presented in the spreadsheet. So the instructions display will always be shown first. Then this first task trial will always be shown after it. Then these six task trials will be shown, uh, but in a shuffled order. So having the same number, so the fact they all have one, means that they're treated as a set for the purposes of randomization. So that's the general principle of how this works. That's just one very simple example. Um, there's a lot more interesting things you can do by using combinations of randomized trials and randomized blocks. Um, but that's, um, if you have questions, feel free to ask them. But for now, I'm um, just going to show you that simple example. Uh, the second important thing to know about the spreadsheet is that it's case sensitive. Um, so you can see this with the answer column over here, which is where we put the image that is the correct answer um, to the relational reasoning task. Um, and you can see that the column heading is not highlighted in green. And that tells you again that there's a problem. This doesn't match uh, something in our task structure. So to figure out what's going on, we go back to our task structure. And because this is about um, how responses are marked, we need to go to the screen where we collect responses from participants. And we need to scroll down to this section of the settings. It's called active response. Um, and you can see this first setting says, if a response's value matches answer in type of case, it represents the correct answer. And the green means it's uh, looking for something in the spreadsheet. It's looking for a column called answer in all caps. But as we saw, the correct answer column is actually in the title case. So if we click OK, go back to the spreadsheet, you can see that that's now fixed. What this lets us do is add feedback to our experiment. So it lets us mark if the answer is correct or incorrect and actually show visual feedback to the participant if that's something we want to do. So again, we go back to the screen where we collect the responses and we're going to add a zone and we're going to make it a feedback accuracy zone. And what this does by default is it will show a tick to the participant if they got the trial correct and across if they got the trial incorrect. Um, so again, we can just preview the task and see what this looks like. I would really recommend this. Play around with the settings, play around with zones, um, preview your task because um, I was going to say you can never break anything by previewing. Um, might be just a blip. 
Let me check if I can go. Okay, this is definitely not supposed to happen. Okay, random blip. <laughs> uh, that's never happened before, so it's wonderful that it would happen while I'm demonstrating on a webinar, but um, it looks like everything is okay now. So let's double check. We still have our feedback zone and preview one more time. Okay, yeah, we're back. Okay. Um, so if I get this wrong, you can see there's a cross. If I get this right, you can see there's a tick. You can adjust um, everything from how long the feedback is shown to the specific images that are used um, to uh, whether the feedback is honest or not. So you can uh, manipulate whether the feedback is, is partially dishonest. Um, I'm going to stop here. Um, this is just a very, very basic implementation of a task. Um, as I'm going to mention when I get to the end of my slides, um, if you're interested in learning more about how to build tasks and questionnaires uh, in Gorilla and put them into experiments, uh, sign up for our onboarding webinar. I'm going to provide the link at the end um, of the talk. But for now, um, I'm going to jump back uh, if we have time. I, I don't have much more uh, to say, Amy, so, uh, but do stop me if, if we're running out of time. Um, more time, keep going. You've got, we've got 15 minutes and okay. plenty cool. of time to get over lots of questions, but carry on. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, that was just a brief rundown of building a task. Um, but uh, once you've built your tasks, your questionnaires, whatever else you want to send to your participants, you have to incorporate them into an experiment. And this is just a GIF of um, our experiment builder interface, which is how you connect all the different tasks that you've built, uh, the questionnaires, and how you actually implement your experiment design. Um, so you can do anything from um, a really simple design like this, where you're just sending all participants to the same set of tasks. You can control the order. Um, you can randomize participants to different conditions. You can do that and control the order. And you can use screening questions. So for example, you can have um, participants who answer one way to a particular question sent to a reject node, so rejected from your experiment, and participants who answer another way continue with the experiment. So you can use it for things like screening questions. So um, yeah, lots, lots and lots of possibilities. And these are just some examples. So at this point, you might be wondering, OK, this sounds, this sounds good, hopefully, um, but how much is it going to cost? Um, so it's completely free to build and preview your tasks and experiments. So we would actually really advise that you give it a go, try it out, figure out if it's going to actually work for your specific study, your specific design. Um, if you decide that it is, um, then you pay per respondent at Gorilla, so you pay to access the data from each participant. If a participant doesn't complete your study, then you don't pay for them. Um, as I said, this is separate from whether you pay participants for their participation. That would be handled via your recruitment service. This is about accessing their data that you've collected via Gorilla. Um, and this pay per respondent policy means that it is um, cheap to get started with running a small study. So for example, you could run a pilot study. Sorry, that's my cat in the background. I didn't even realize she was in the room. Um, if you uh, then find that you're starting to use Gorilla at a higher volume, you can save money using subscriptions. Um, so we have flexible options ranging from individual researcher subscriptions um, up to labs for smaller research groups, um, all the way to departments and uh, whole institutions. Um, and we currently have subscription arrangements with over 300 institutions around the world. Um, so check if yours is already among them. Um, they might be. Um, but in general, uh, yes, we have packages to suit all budgets. And you can find out more about our pricing model and what is included um, by looking at our pricing page here. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit now about um, some advanced tools that we have um, on top of the ones that I've kind of demonstrated today. Um, and these are either available now or will be available soon. So we're excited about these because they're kind of the new things we have coming up. And the first is Shop Builder. So um, to your participants, Shop Builder looks like a normal, realistic online shop. Um, but behind the scenes, it's a powerful research tool for consumer decision making research. Um, so you can manipulate all kinds of things about the products that are available to your participants, uh, product swaps, discounts, all of the things you might be interested in manipulating for consumer research. Um, if that's your field, uh, give it a try. It's available now and it's free to try it out and preview. If you want to actually incorporate a shop builder task into an experiment and collect data, then there is an additional fee. So um, uh, yeah, give it a go. And if you're interested, you can drop us an email at info.gorilla.sc. 
Um, Game Builder is another new thing we have coming down the line that we're very excited about. Um, as I mentioned before, when you're running studies online, it's really important to maintain participants' attention, engagement, and motivation. And there's really no better way to do that than by making the task something that is actually fun for your participants to do. Um, so the idea behind Game Builder is it makes it possible um, for researchers to create uh, 2D games without having to become game developers. So again, just like the Task Builder, it's a point and click um, graphical user interface. Um, and yeah, you can make tasks fun. Um, you can create educational games to engage students and improve their learning. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of potential there. The public launch for Game Builder is going to be early next year. Um, it is available now as part of our early access scheme. Um, so if you'd be interested in giving it a try, you can get in touch again, info at gorilla.sc um, is the best way to reach us. Um, and finally, multiplayer. So this is a function that is going to be available across all of our tools, so including the task builder. Um, and this is great if you do research on communication or interaction. So um, as it sounds, multiplayer is going to enable you to have multiple participants participate in tasks simultaneously and interact with each other. So do things like negotiation games or communication games. That's all going to be possible. Um, again, uh, the public launch will be early next year, um, but just like Game Builder, it is available now as part of our early access scheme. Um, so do get in touch if you'd be interested in giving it a try. <clears throat> so uh, what next? If this all sounds appealing to you, uh, what are your next steps? Um, so uh, if you're interested in exploring Gorilla, sign up for an account. Um, signing up is free. Um, as I mentioned, it's no obligation. You can play around and see if you can build your task, build your experiment, give it a go. Um, if you use this promo code that we have come up with with Sage, so Gorilla Sage 2021, um, you get 50 free tokens when you buy 50 tokens. Um, so tokens like it's one token per access to one participant's data. Um, and this offer runs until the 31st of January. So even if you're not running a study right now, even if you don't think you would use it immediately, um, it's still well worth uh, using the promo code and claiming this. Um, as I briefly mentioned earlier, if you like what you've seen and you want to learn more um, about the kind of practicalities of how to build questionnaires, tasks, put them in experiments, it's basically an expanded version of the quick 15 minute thing I did just now, um, come to one of our bi-weekly onboarding webinars. So um, yeah, it's uh, like the, the task building um, follow along thing I did, but uh, we take you through the whole process of building questionnaires and tasks, putting them into an experiment and collecting data. Um, and we also um, kind of introduce you to all of the support resources that we have um, and um, yeah, other things we have to help you along the way. So thank you very much for listening. Um, and yeah, that's me and I'd be very happy to take any questions. Oh yeah, Ashley's just dropped the link to the onboarding webinars in the chat. Hi, thanks very much. That was amazing, Katrina. Um, we've had lots of questions come through in the chat and Ashley is here now as well, which Ashley, I know you've answered quite a few, but I might call out a couple of them because they're already answered, but they're good for other people on the call to hear. Um, but maybe let's go to a couple of the um, non-answered questions first. Um, so Christian Rodriguez has asked, is there any way to run multi-participant experiments with Gorilla, is that i.e. economic games? Um, yeah, so that will be possible um, with multiplayer. So as I mentioned, that's one of our features that is upcoming. Um, if you're interested in trying it out, do contact us at info at gorilla.sc um, because we do have an early access scheme, um, as I mentioned, so you can get access to that, try it out, um, give us your feedback, be part of the development of it. If you'd rather wait until it's, um, you know, all, it is still being tested right now, so if you'd rather fit, wait until it's completely finished and ready to go, it should be available early next year. Great. And then we also had a question about um, a couple of questions on data, the sort of data access. So Dr. Melinda Connor asked, who has access to the actual data that's collected? And Ashley, I know you answered already this, but maybe you want to call that out again for everyone else. Uh, yeah. So as, as I kind of said to Melinda at Gorilla, we are very kind of, we're very aware of the importance of data security and um, of making sure that 
kind of everything is kosher, everything is okay, everything's kept well together. And um, we have loads of due, 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 due diligence is a hard word to say at the end of a long day. Um, information on our website. Uh, we are fully GDPR compliant. And I think if anyone has any further questions, because I know it, there can be so many different questions around this kind of this kind of topic, we'd be happy to kind of help as much as we can. Um, I've just dropped a link in the chat um, that has um, where we keep all of the information that Ashley just referred to. All of our due diligence information um, is available on our website. So if you have an ethics application, for example, that you need to provide details on exactly how your data will be stored, um, you can copy it from here. We have a GDPR um, statement, uh, again, that you can use. Um, so yeah, we are very aware that this is an important, an important topic for researchers. And I also think we've now, um, as we do work with so many universities across the world, it's, it's getting hard to ask us a question about data security that we haven't heard before. And um, so we do try and help as much as we can. Mm -hmm. And another question here about, is there any limit on the file size that can be uploaded on Gorilla at one time? Um, so I think, there is a limit. Um, I don't know off the top of my head what it is, but there are ways around it. So um, if you are experiencing problems with um, uploading uh, your files, then you can submit a support ticket and our support team will usually be able to find a workaround where they will um, manually upload the files for you. I know that's happened in the past. Great, thanks. Um, and also another question here on whether Gorilla supports other languages, in particular Spanish for this question, but others as well. Yeah, so um, I was looking at that question and I'm afraid at the moment we don't have um, our support documents, for example, um, available in other languages. Um, if you're able to use the tools in English, we do have localization um, abilities, so you can customise um, the instructions in the zones of your task. You can um, customise all of the kind of automatic text um, that, that shows up to be in the language that your participants will be using. Um, but that is something that we're trying to improve in the future is the accessibility of our support documentation in different languages. Amazing, thanks. I'm just going to drop in a link to the localization guide. Um, yeah, great. I'm also re-dropping in the code um, in the chat and just reiterating because we had a couple of questions about the recording that you will all be sent the recording um, either tomorrow or early next week. You'll get an email with the recording and a link to the slides. Um, and the discount code will be in there again as well. Um, so you'll have all that information. And also do keep an eye out on methodspace.com where we post a lot of these recordings and the Sage YouTube channel as well. Um, then back to some questions. Uh, one from Dr. Um, Dr. Chen here. So do you know any publications that use Gorilla in measuring people's behavior in virtual world or VR? Ooh, um, Ashley, do you, you probably have a better knowledge of the publications than I do. I feel like I saw one when I was rounding up the publications I have a the feeling there might be something. I can't think of it off the top of my head. I can um, if you can send to us the publications page in the chat. So the publications page is something that I've been working on a lot lately. And if you open it, you'll see that there is an incredibly wide range of research that's been conducted on Gorilla. Um, oh, I found one. I, you found one? Um, there's, see, well, I don't we have if, everything. <laughs> I don't know if it's um, specifically what the questioner was asking about, but there is a paper on um, face identification in the laboratory and in virtual worlds. I'm just going to drop the citation in the chat in case it's helpful, but um, yeah. That was a very quick find. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I'd seen it. That's the thing. I, I was like, if I search for virtual, something's going to come up. But yeah, it may or may not be relevant. But um, yeah, the publications page is there if you want to take a look. That's right. What, another question about a sort of not citation question, but uh, what grid has been used in. Um, so from Peter here, who said um, he's actually more into climate change and agriculture research, not behavioral. Mm -hmm. He's curious to know more about a gorilla. So has it been used in any climate change research that you're aware of? I feel like, I don't know, uh, Ashley, do you have any knowledge? Not on off one? the top of my head, but as I've said, it's been used in such a wide range of research that it wouldn't surprise me if um, some of our users have done climate change research using martial, uh, martial arts. I've gone to like my, I've, I've jumped to my own PhD topic just before talking about <laughs> research. Um, research brain, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> research brain. Um, um, I'm, I'm not, not getting any of it. 
when I search climate on the publications page, but it could be that there's other keywords that um, would be worth searching for. But um, yeah, I feel like we started off with mainly, um, our users were mainly psychology researchers, but that's expanding all the time. Um, uh, yeah, and it, it's, it, there's much more that you can do beyond classic reaction time tasks. Um, we have, I didn't really mention that we have the questionnaire builder as well, so you can do um, a huge variety of survey based um, research as well. So um, yeah. Great, I'm aware we've only got a couple of minutes. Um, the most of the questions have already been answered, but there's a couple more coming in. Um, so one from an anonymous attendee here saying, does Gorilla support two different tasks in one screen? So for instance, can a participant see an image here and an audio simultaneously, or is it one task at a time? Um, so in terms of presenting image and audio simultaneously, that's absolutely possible. So you would just, um, put an image zone and a web audio zone on the same screen. Um, uh, it kind of depends what you mean by different tasks. Um, generally, um, in terms of collecting responses from participants, you can collect um, one type of response per screen. So you would either be collecting keyboard input or you'd be collecting a click button response. Um, but in terms of having multiple uh, stimuli at a time displayed to participants, that's, that's absolutely possible, yeah. And then just for the one last minute, last question. Um, so I don't know if it was mentioned, but when was Gorilla, a Gorilla developed and by whom? Um, so oh, I can bring back, I had a slide on that, but it could be that... Um, I think we had a, yeah, I had a couple of people who joined a little bit later. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, basically Gorilla was launched in um, October 2016 um, and it's part of uh, Cauldron Science. Um, so these are our founders, um, Joe Evershed, who has a background in business and psychology, and Nick Hodges, who has a background in game development. So they're really bringing together kind of the world of research and the world of software development. Um, and yeah, the goal was really just to um, take the burden of having to learn to program away from researchers to make it possible to do complex online research without having to learn to code. Um, but yeah, uh, 2016 is when it was founded, but it's um, grown hugely. We're still growing all the time. Take a look at the About page um, and learn more about our team because there's some really interesting people who work here. And it's, um, yeah, if you're interested in careers outside academia as well, uh, take a look because we've always got new positions coming up all the time. So yeah. Great, thank you very much. Well, we're at time. I just want to thank you again for the experiment. We had a lot of great questions come through and Ashley, you answered them very speedily. So thank you for that as well. Ashley and I popped in the chat earlier again, the code um, and the sign up link um, if you want to try out Gorilla. And also, as mentioned, you'll receive the recording. And if you do want to sign up for those webinars um, that Katrina mentioned, just go to the Gorilla website and you can get them from there. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thanks very much. Cheers.